Halo, the young adult paranormal romance angel series, not the shooty alien game. It's it's really, 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 really bad. And I know that's an extremely controversial and bold take, uh, visionary even. But yeah, it's it's very bad. When I read Halo, uh, the first book in this 2010 to 2012 trilogy, it was a torturous experience of one like really, really bad angel who sucks at being angel and pages of absolutely nothing. Then the trilogy takes a turn, becoming one of my favorite extremely bad fiction series. And not just because I'm completely obsessed with angels. So Halo begins as this conservative Christian fantasy about an angel who descends from heaven to help an upper-class white town that didn't need any help, while inspiring everyone to go to church and, like, be moral. But then in book two, we go to hell, and Lucifer is named Big Daddy, and by book three, the silence from Doctor Who are chasing down the main couple, who are pretending to be siblings while also dating, and the male lead turns out to be, like, the Avatar from Avatar The Last Airbender. The series, like, jumps off the rails, and it's just a delight to talk about, so I'm just really excited to do that. Uh, this review is actually from my backlog on my blog, which is Crow Defeats Books. Uh, dot wordpress.com and what that means is that it is actually three separate reviews stitched together from like a year or two ago at this point uh, I've edited it but the pacing might feel a bit different because of that it's going to be more section than my perfected review and there's also like going to be nearly no quotes because I actually only recently started doing tons and tons of quotes when I do reviews with page numbers and such but it's still going to be very much the same sort of format and style, and this again is one of those absolutely off-the-walls insane book series where when you first look at it you think this is not going to be anything and this won't be interesting, and then, dear god, by the end it's absolutely ridiculous, and I'm just, I'm going to go right into it, and I just am, I'm really, like this is again, uh, I've read nearly every single paranormal romance angel book out there. That's sort of like my personal quest in life, apparently. The 2010s, 2011 era paranormal angel romance books, young adult. That's my specialist genre. I've read all of the mainstream ones at this point, though I haven't finished Hush Hush because that is actually my least favorite one. I despise it. But I'm, I'm working my way through and then I'm probably going to read all the obscure ones and Halo. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I, I'm so I'm so excited to just go straight into this one. Uh, and I also just I wanted really quickly do a video because I'm gonna be gone for a couple of days, um, doing matters and things like that and all sorts of other sort of business, which means I won't be able to do one. I want to do one, and I don't know if I'll be able to do another thing before the end of the month. So please enjoy. <laughs> Bethany Rose, and yes, that classic angelic name, Bethany Rose, is an angel. She's new and on her first mission to Earth to fight the forces of evil. Along for the ride are Ivy and Archangel Gabriel, the ones who actually do anything at all because Beth is horrible at being an angel. Right off the bat, Beth meets the seemingly unavailable Xavier Woods, whose girlfriend died in a house fire about two years ago. He immediately picks Beth as being special and likes her, and then they're dating extremely quickly. She quickly tells him that she's an angel and shows her wings. This leads to no real drama. It's kind of over with very quickly for a paranormal romance like this, where usually that sort of reveal is, I mean, the end of the book. Xavier is a good Christian boy, and while Gabriel checks with the Archangel Council, orders from on high allow Beth to date Xavier, even though angels aren't meant to do this. It's, it's fine, yeah. So, yeah, Beth and Xavier are inseparable as a couple. They are the definition of white bread. Bethany doesn't have any particular character traits, and neither does Xavier. You know, they're perfectly in love and love each other, and that's about it. Mind, um, when bad boy demon Jake Thorne shows up suddenly about halfway through, he forces himself on Beth and kisses her at prom. 
Xavier then ignores Beth's explanation and breaks up with her for a week, thinking this is some sort of cheating. But then they get back together and they're fine. Nothing actually really happens in book one, is what I'm saying. It, Jake Thorne is the only real conflict and event. He shows up about halfway through. He's super creepy, again, touching Beth, hitting on her nonstop, despite her constantly bringing up Xavier and not showing any interest. But also, Bethany, like, immediately starts calling Jake Thorne her friend, and is very sympathetic to this demon. After she rejects his, you know, assault during prom, he makes it clear, hey, I'm a demon. And Beth and her angel family do nothing about this. They're just like, oh no, a demon, that's bad. But... And they wait until he gains a cult following, it takes a while, and he just sort of recruits all the goths in school and he forces one girl to um, end her life. And the angels continue to do nothing about this demon, this demonic incursion on the community they've been sent here to protect. They kind of just pray and wait for God to show them a path or a sign. Eventually, Beth's friend Molly is picked up by Jake Thorne, and Beth is concerned for her friend and gets tired of waiting for God. So she goes to confront him at a graveyard where he's reading a spell book to get, like, evil ghosts to possess members of his posse. Beth gets kidnapped, but then Gabriel bursts in to save the day through a wall, and Beth kisses Xavier, and the power of true love is what sends Jake Thorne back to hell. And if that sounded kind of disjointed as a plot, it's because the first book of the Halo trilogy is extremely bad. And when I say that it's really boring, I'm not kidding. It's actually a very thick book. I have just finished my plot summary, in fact. And yeah, there's absolutely nothing in it. And I'm just excited to get on with the sort of story because book two and three, off the rails. Book one... A girl named Beth, who is actually an angel and sucks at being an angel, gets a human boyfriend and it's fine. A demon shows up and they don't do anything until she kisses her boyfriend and he goes to hell. That is the full events of book one. Moving on to a bit of discussion about the themes, though, of this book. The angels in this trilogy suck. And we're going to get into a lot of it more. Like I say, this is going to be a lot more sectional than when I normally do reviews, so we will talk more about the role of angels as we go on. But here's an aside right now, because there's very little plot in book one, but we can sort of start to talk about some early problems in the world and dive into it. And very big problem, especially as a huge angel fanatic like I am, these angels suck so much. Beth, Ivy, and Gabriel, they have no real powers, nor do they really do anything, but at the same time, they're also doing way too much. Like, I, I, I find these angels so distasteful to an interesting interpretation of angels as a creature or being. It feels rude to call them a creature, actually. So these angels, they have paper-thin wings, which they fold under their clothes, they have no belly button, um, they're all beautiful. They're, everybody likes them instantly, they just sort of have a ma magnetic like aura to them, and that's about it. They're sent around the world to combat the forces of evil by being in human flesh and hanging out, I guess. It's one of the biggest problems I had with this book and even with this series, and it kind of took me a bit to place. Like, angels by nature are defined as watchers or messengers particularly, and even in this book, like, those roles are mentioned. It's very important that no humans learn that the angels, our angels, are actually angels. They are integrated as humans. Um, the two older angels, Ivy and Gabriel, are basically in the community. Gabriel is like a music teacher, while Beth, the new one, is a high school student. They are perfectly integrated and pretending to be human. And that sort of is both, it makes sense as your like mission because it's sort of a fun idea of angels secretly having to pretend to be human to help people, but also, as a mission, it doesn't make any clear sense, because they don't actually have a directive, they're just living here. Beth is going to normal human high school, and that is it. There is no further goal or anything. They're not sneaking around finding and fighting demons, or, you know, there's some particular one bad problem in this community, no, they're just hanging out. It's a delightful seaside town that is 
seemingly very affluent. There's no problems. I know in a later book at one point, Beth legitimately thinks to herself that she's very lucky she wound up in this town because some angels have to go off to like war zones and that sucks. And she's like, well, it's nice that I wound up at this community. And yeah, I guess it is nice, but that's, wow, you're a bad angel then. Your whole point is to help humanity. And you're like, wow, I sure would hate to help humanity too much by going where I'm needed. How they're needed in this community is entirely unclear, but apparently they are, and their mission is to just chill. They get people involved in community service. That's apparently it. Because they're, they're just super likable, these guys. They're very special, and they're all beautiful. Uh, they are all blonde hair, white skin, blue eyes considered to be the most like attractive gorgeous people everyone's drawn to them and so everyone in the local community just starts following their lead and does good deeds because the angels tell them to or because the angels start doing good deeds and they just want to follow suit and that's cheating that's that's cheating right like rather than let humans make their own decision and lead whatever life they wish you know, with the desire that they will abandon doing bad things and find faith or do good or whatever, these guys are using their supernatural angel charms to make people good. It's very clear in the book a lot of people are only joining the church or after-school programs because they have a crush on Ivy or Gabriel and want to impress them. That's absolutely doing good for the wrong reasons. Like, yeah, like, if you're doing a community cleanup and you're joining because there's a really hot music teacher and you want to impress the music teacher, I guess that park is still getting cleaned, but that's clearly not quite what you would expect from an angel book, especially this one, which has very strong Christian ideas and very traditional Christian ideas, which I will talk about. And it just immediately rubbed me such the wrong way. Because, yeah, it's not, the humans aren't willingly doing these sorts of things, really. They're being manipulated without knowing it because there's these extremely hot angels around. And it's, of course, worth noting that the book posits this really limited idea of what, like, good is. There's no nuance. It's, it's the church. <laughs> yeah, like, Ivy and Gabriel are going around being super sexy and oozing niceness. And church numbers more than triple. And the town is described as being a sort of haven of goodness because of this. Being a Christian is held up as the pinnacle of being a good person. And even if we also learn people are like volunteering at old folks home and learning about animal rights, it still feels like a really specific idea of what a good community is. Because the community isn't being defined by the people going and helping and doing community service and like helping the poor. The standard is pretty clearly more people are going to church, and thus everything else is fine. And that kind of Christian idea runs through the book series as a whole, and is very much a theme that we're going to talk about quite a lot more. Uh, this book, I will, and I will strictly say right up front, it's not sold as Christian lit. It very much is kind of Christian lit, but it was sold as a mainstream young adult paranormal romance. The fact that it's Christian is not right up front, in any way, and it wasn't sold as like a specialty press. So a lot of my critique comes from the idea that it is not a Christian lit explicit book from like a Christian press, you know, it's a mainstream book. And there's nothing wrong with a book having religious ideas in it or um, being influenced by the author's religion or being about religion at all. Obviously, one of my main things is I love angel books and a lot of angel books, especially from this time, are also Christian books, whether they are the kind of book that is extremely, like, definitely Christian or just based on Christian um, lore in some way. It's a common thing. I'm used to it. There's usually even just theming. If it's not as explicit, it's fine. I I'm used to it. But what I don't like is when a book is extremely preachy in a sort of way or when it, um, kind of puts down other religions or in this ca okay if I'm gonna be honest with this book with Halo the biggest issue I've always really had with it is that it's Christian but it feels like it's doing a really bad job of being Christian which feels so strange to say but 
I I like some Christian theming in books. Uh, obviously, as you can tell, I'm not um, Christian myself, but there's some nice themes that you can explore in a book, and it's an angel book, and you know, ideas of like forgiveness and selflessness and um, sacrifice. Those are very Christian ideas and themes, and you can have a lovely time with a lot of those. But I honestly feel like one of the biggest problems of Halo is that it's not very good at being a Christian book, despite being the most explicitly let's all go to church sort of books out there. It, like, with the angels and with the fact that everybody starts going to church not because it's correct and like a way to go and, you know, improve the community or whatever, or learn moral le lessons. They're going to church and being good people because they really like the angels, which feels like the most... <laughs> it just feels so wrong. It feels like it's not even a Christian idea in this extremely Christian book. Because they're going to church because they love these angels, not because they love being good people or because they're interested in becoming more moral or anything like that. So... Halo just really fails on that front, and it, it quite, it, it really does irritate me. And we're going to talk a lot about the Christian theming of it, but that's a reoccurring thing. It's a very, very Christian book. It's a very traditional, conservative ideas of Christianity. Very, very much. But it's not very good at actually representing a lot of those ideas in the way that by, it doesn't actually feel like it's a... <laughs> I feel like I'm being a bit repetitive here, but the main point that I'm trying to say is that Halo's a very bad book. It wasn't sold as Christian lit, it is Christian lit, and it doesn't even have the gall to correctly portray Christian ideas in a very good way. It's also true that, like, conservative Christian as a term is a cursed term to me. And it's actually used a few times right in this book. Xavier jokes about his mom and her extreme Christian values as if it's this light thing, like her being a traditionalist. And all I can think when I'm reading that is that she's absolutely homophobic and would not respect my human rights. Like, considering how the author treats even just goths and like people who like alternative fashion, which is to say, in this paranormal romance book, which belongs to the goths, goths are bad people, or they're basically misled people who are off on some tragic path. Yeah, I, I think that the author wouldn't like me either. Gender roles are also in reinforced in this book a bit. There's certainly a lot of like, I'm a girl, so I like pretty things and have emotions, versus I'm a boy, so I know cars and joke about hot chicks. It's... Yeah. Beth and Xavier's relationship feels like this fantasy of a Catholic school teacher in many ways. Though they kiss often, they have this strange, calm, uninterest in sex and sexuality. Xavier says he had sex, or at least a more physical relationship, with his last girlfriend, but he's entirely happy to barely touch Beth. Now, I'm asexual, so this relationship where they, you know, kiss a bit and just mostly cuddle sounds very good to me. But in the context of Xavier and Beth and the idea that they're, you know, very average high school students, heterosexuals, everything feels very mechanical. He loves her so completely, and he loves God so much, he just doesn't feel at all an interest in sex now despite having had it in the past. He, he looks at Beth and he's just overwhelmed with such pure, like, holy love that he is forgoes all sexuality. Uh, their relationship is just bleached clean of anything but bland dialogue and this kind of creepy codependency. Sex is actually scorned in this book. Xavier's mom refuses to let her eldest engaged daughter, who has been dating her fiancé for six years, sleep in the same house as her fiancé, like, when they visit. Beth is obviously happy without sex, I mean, good for her, and Beth's friend Molly, like, laments how much she wishes she'd waited, and Molly's portrayed as, like, this kind of party girl who, um, you know, goes out all the time and likes boys, but once she starts hanging with Beth, she starts lamenting how she really wishes that she waited. And also, in regards to sex and sexuality, I need to cover again how bad Beth is at being an angel. 
she shirks all her duties as a heavenly messenger meant to be bringing peace and love in favor of spending time with her illegal human boyfriend. I know the Bible doesn't spend enough time on angels. Um, I'm going to launch a petition on the subject as we speak. Like, let's, let's get some more angels in there. But I'm fairly sure most of the questions Beth has about her love for Xavier were covered. Uh, can an angel have sex with a human? I mean, ask the friggin' guys who did and ended up creating the Nephilim. And, and what about love? I mean, the Bible is vague. Um, those angels who made the Nephilim could have been in love for all we know. But either ways, those suckers were struck down right for their sin. Angels are quite clearly not meant to be like human. They act as messengers and hang around heaven singing worship for God nonstop, but they don't have the same rights. This is a big thing, and one of my favorite actual concepts about angels is the fact that they're not humans. They don't have free will. They are essentially tools created for a purpose. Some of them are messengers who send a message. Some of them maybe are fighting demons, or some of them just hang around like the throne of God and, you know, sing praises all day for eternity. Angels are beings, and they're very interesting, and I love them so much, but they are not people. And I love fiction that makes them people and explores the ideas of it. I, I love angel fiction. But I think that not thinking about this idea, and if you're going to question angels and humanity and their relationship, you need to kind of understand the idea of how angels are portrayed in religious texts, which is as beings without free will, and explore that more. And Beth kind of wonders about that, but also it doesn't matter in this book at all and it you know isn't explored and also if that's something that interests you at all dear god i mean <laughs> I, I lean forward to pull out my book good angel and i kick the table accidentally and it shakes because i, I don't like to promo in the middle of this review i usually save that for the end but Dear God, if you're interested in the idea of angels as tools and angels and free will and all that, that's literally what my book duology Good Angel is about. It's about the idea of what it means to be a good angel, as in what it means to be a messenger or tool or being created without free will that questions free will and if that is a good thing to have for you. Anyways, anyways, <laughs> this review has become a bit rambly because I'm going off script quite a lot. So, like, remember Lucifer? Because Beth sure doesn't. Like, I'm not the sharpest on religious lore. I love angels. I'm not a dictionary. But uh, Satan basically thought he was better than God or even an equal. Like, he refused to worship, as angels were pretty much made to do, and convinced other angels to follow him. This is pretty much a fight for free will. Like, angels do not have a choice like humans do on what to follow or do, but Lucifer chose to defy God and was punished for it. Beth knows she's not meant to reveal herself to humans, get close to humans, yet does both of Xavier. Then she questions why she isn't allowed to break these rules. Well, Beth, it's probably because you're not supposed to defy heavenly orders. Remember Lucifer. You're doing the same sort of thing. You're questioning the authority of God and those orders. And the reason why you're not meant to do it is because the last guy who did, you know, got sent down to hell and it was a whole big thing. You, you should know this, Beth. She barely even acknowledges the whole, like, I am a being of pure light and energy from another plane of existence, and I know for a fact God is real. She quickly jumps to selfish ideas of her own pleasures and dating Xavier. Which sounds a lot like I'm shaming her for it, but so much of this very boring book is her running around in her head wondering if this is right or good, but not really thinking deeper besides just like, oh, I really like him. I sure hope this is okay. <laughs> and, you know, and she gets away with it. Like, where's that Old Testament God when you need him? You know, striking down wrongdoers in an instant. Beth is just incredibly whiny about how she's not allowed to date Xavier and has to keep it a secret and how that's not fair. You know, grow up, Beth. You're not even a good enough angel to have a real angel name. Jake Thorne. <laughs> So, Jake Thorne is the demon who shows up about halfway. Again, I know the plot summary was so much shorter than anything else in this review is going to be, and I apologize for that. It's a different kind of format. It's a different kind of book. So, Jake Thorne. I mean, we all know the formula of bad young adult books, right? Like, 
you have a love triangle. You have, if you imagine a young adult book, there is a good boy and there is a bad boy and there is a bland girl who must make a decision and she's always going to pick the good boy, but she's going to be tempted by that bad boy in book two. And Jake Thorne defies this in such an odd way. He's introduced after a point where the lead and her true love have said, I love you, and he offers absolutely nothing. I was waiting for the obvious points to come up, like he's a demon, he'd be, you know, super hot and she'd feel lust for him or something. He'd show her a world where free will and freedom existed. He'd point out Xavier's controlling behavior, but no. It might have to do with, like, the heavy Christian themes, but Jake sucks from the start. He touches Beth's hand and arm constantly, he flirts with her nonstop, he argues with her, and at prom he forcibly makes out with her. Near the end, he ties her up and basically says he's planning to rape her. But for unknown reasons, Beth kind of puts up with this for a while, calling him her friend despite in not enjoying a single conversation they have together. And when he turns out to be an evil demon, she mourns instead of hates him. It's definitely just kind of the Christian idea of forgiveness. But it feels so strange, her reaction the whole time. He spends the rest of the series as a not love interest at all, who is still a love interest. Ish. Uh, not really, but he has his fangirls. <laughs> you know, when you, when you look at the reviews for other books, there are people from like 2010 who adore Jake Thorne. And you will see, I mean, in book two, he turns out to be a Nazi, and you will see how that is absolutely ridiculous. So, Jake Thorne, and I will keep calling him his full name because it's so dumb and edgy, he isn't even allowed a breath of any sort of counter-message to the godliness going on. There's no temptation about him. Beth doesn't even find him that attractive or good-looking, though obviously he is super popular and hot and everyone is jealous, like, that he likes Beth. Jake Thorne comments a lot on how interesting Beth is. When he asks how she'd describe herself in one word, she can't think of one, and he remarks that makes her complex. I think she's too simple for even one word. I'm so used to YA plot beats. I thought for sure Jake Thorne's demon narrative would happen, like, as I mentioned. To add to my sureness, Xavier changes a lot as Jake Thorne shows up. Xavier has no personality mind, but his behavior changes once he learns Beth is an angel, and the other angels look to him to keep her safe. Yes, even though he's a human and she's a literal angel, her angel siblings are like, you better keep Beth safe, random teenage boy. And in response, Xavier becomes controlling. Very controlling. He refuses to let her carry her own books, eat the wrong food, talk to the wrong people, or even open the door to the car. He's hyper vigilant on what she's doing and keeping her safe. He does her schoolwork and keeps her focused. He is insanely cautious about everything she does and says. It's definitely wildly controlling behavior and like a sure red flag in a relationship, but Beth thinks nothing of it. I thought like Jake Thorne's role was to say, hey, aren't you a bit annoyed Xavier tells you who you should and shouldn't be friends with? But he doesn't. Like most people in the book, he's this simple-minded idea introduced sort of out of a YA obligation to have a bad boy, and yet restricted by the Christian narrative where he's not actually allowed to be anything but a villain because he's a demon. Book one is not really anything special. Again, it's really bad at telling a good angel story. It's a bit too Christian, but it's overall very boring, and the plot summary is literally nothing at all. <laughs> but we're entering book two now, and like I said, book two is one of my absolute favorite bad books. It's one of those ones that I actually recommend people read for fun. It's still very thick and still very bad and boring, but it's enjoyable because there's just enough absolute insanity inside that I think it's legit a good bad read. You just want to skip book one entirely and go straight into Hades. So, book two. Bethany is deeply in love with her perfect boyfriend, Xavier. Her high school friends even question if she's too codependent. When quiz, she only likes a majority of things simply because Xavier likes them and knows every part of his day to minute detail. 
If this early lead-in to questioning their overprotective, codependent relationship gives you any hope, kill it now. The message of this book is perhaps they're not codependent enough. So at a Halloween party, best friends throw a seance, which concerns her since she knows demons and ghosts are totally real. She doesn't stop them because she doesn't want to be a buzzkill and participates. We get this lovely line though. Even someone who'd never seen a Ouija board couldn't miss its association with the dark arts and the narrative remarks on the toy trademarked by Hasbro, first invented in 1890. So the seance goes all spooky, allowing Jake Thorne to escape from hell, where he'd been banished last book by True Love's Kiss or whatever. He tricks Bethany onto climbing onto a motorbike with him, and then takes her to hell, via the highway of course. Beth is needlessly confused by this development. Part of her memories are inexplicably blocked, but she can remember Jake Thorne as a demon, and she can remember the highway opening up with this deep fissure and falling. But wherever could she be? She has no idea. She's in this dark, smoky underground land at the foot of a nightclub called Pride, where two goths regard Jake with respect as a prince and they tease Beth. The club is strange, full of more goths, and seems to lead to this underground tunnelscape of more nightclubs and soulless humans. But wherever could Beth be? After asking everyone, constantly, she's finally told she's in hell, or Hades as Jake Thorne insists it should be called, and instantly faints. It's ridiculous. This scene though, as frustrating as it is, introduces one of my absolute favorite, I don't know, things in existence, and I'm going to read you a very short quote. The two goths who guard the nightclub taunt Beth quite a lot, and it leads to them saying this line as she wonders who they are. You want to know who we are, doll face? She asked. We're the door bitches. And that, that's it. That's it. I, I don't, there's nothing really more to say about it, but the fact that this book, Hades, a real book that exists in this world, this book, has two characters canonically named the Door Bitches, who I'm quite sure never occur again in this book, are never referenced again, have no role in anything, but they're called the Door Bitches, and I love them so much. So Beth stays in this luxurious suite while in hell, where she learns Jake Thorne has taken her to be his future bride. He's very insistent she can have whatever she wants and live a life of lovely luxury, as long as she just gives up on Xavier and her angel siblings. Her only thought is to escape from these sinful demons, obviously, and she finds two allies among the captured souls. Hannah, a teenage maid, and Tucker, a boy without a personality but with a heavy southern accent. The next new character is Asia, who is this sort of fabulous stereotype of this jealous, slutty demon who's in love with Jake Thorne and has lots of sex. She is the only non-white character to feature in this trilogy so far, and one of the very few overall. It takes well over 50% of the book for anything to happen beyond the inciting incident of Beth going to hell. She gains the power to astral project, leading to much of the book being Beth watching scenes on Earth with Xavier, her friend Molly, and her angel siblings. On Earth, the gang is trying to think of how to rescue Beth, but has absolutely no ideas and isn't getting any help from angels or heaven. They're eventually sent to a neighboring state to exercise a nun, at which point Archangel Michael lends them a divine sword of solving all your problems so they can break into hell. Spoilers for the end. Beth is inducted in this strange ceremony where Jake makes her face a crowd of doomed souls, a pedophile priest puts a crown on her head, and he instructs everyone to treat Beth as a princess of hell. She hates this and sends an orb of light out of her body which turns into a butterfly. This is so scandalous she must be punished, and the eight fallen angels who rule hell, of which Jake is one, have a meeting with Lucifer, where it's determined Beth should burn at the stake. This doesn't work, so they throw her in a jail cell for a few days. Jake breaks her out, but is jealous she still loves Xavier, so Jake teleports to Earth to throw Xavier off a cliff. Beth makes a deal to save Xavier's life in exchange for having sex with... Jake? 
Jake then takes her to a honeymoon cave. They nearly have sex. And then Xavier drives a car through a cave wall to save the day. I, <laughs> I cannot, I really can't explain it any clearer than that. And I can't explain it any, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. They, they do in fact drive a car through a cave into hell, into the honeymoon sex cave. Oh, and then Jake Thorne is stabbed to death by Gabriel with a special sword. <laughs> I really don't know what to say. It's some of the most ludicrous series of events, and I wish it was just, like, one chapter <laughs> of events of Beth creating a butterfly that makes a bunch of archangels who all call Lucifer Big Daddy, which I'll get to, then deciding to burn her at a stake, so then she goes to jail because she can't burn at the stake, but then Jake takes her from jail and throws her boyfriend off a cliff so that she'll have sex with him, but then her boyfriend drives a car and somebody else stabs it. I, I, it's... <laughs> I, I really, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm rambling so much, but dear God is the climax of this book so much. In the epilogue, Xavier ditches high school graduation with Beth to propose to her, and then he reveals he plans to immediately marry her at a local church, and thunder rattles ominously. God, God, Hades is a book. God, is it a book. Okay. Jake Thorne, part two. So this book is about absolutely nothing. But after that, it's about Jake Thorne. Jake, and I, I want to always keep calling him Jake Thorne. I'm going to start calling him Jake because admittedly, it's a lot to keep saying Jake Thorne. <laughs> He's weird. He, he's always this sort of bizarre character in this rather generic story. But then Hades goes on to prove that, like, well, it wasn't actually as generic as we think. There's a sex cave involved. And, yeah, I, I think the issue is that the book is very Christian. Because Jake is treated as sort of a love interest, but also a vile villain. And the book is torn about that. Jake is the villain. He kidnaps Beth. He's killed people and her friends. He's threatened to rape and nearly does rape her again. He's a supreme creep. Yet the writing does not often reflect this properly. For one, uh, the book frequently reminds us how attractive he is. His pale skin and his beautiful hair, Beth doesn't often think he's attractive to her, but she definitely understands he is objectively really hot. And it's not done as some sort of contrast of his attractiveness versus his rotten interior. It's just this reminder that he's really hot, like this YA obligation. The story itself only shows, increasingly, how much Jake is a villain. Yet many times in the narrative, Beth finds comfort in him, sees sadness in his eyes, or pities how he longs for love. She rarely finds herself disgusted, though it is true she never has a moment where she like-likes him. In any other book, he'd be a love interest, and in many ways... Jake is written as a love interest, the other side of this love triangle. Love triangles are such a staple of YA in this area, and are very formulaic in terms of character types. Last book, before he became entirely deprived, Jake fit the mold much more. He was sensitive, he liked poetry, he was dark and broody and mysterious before we learned he was a demon. In any other generic story, he'd be the temptation towards darkness that throws our heroine's heart a flutter as she deals with these complex feelings. You know, if this bad boy can ever be redeemed. But this book isn't a generic YA. It's Christian. And because of this, when Jake enters the picture last book, it's after Beth and Xavier have said, I love you, and this are cemented as endgame. Jake stands no chance in Beth's heart and never did. Furthermore, he's a demon and demons are bad. No aspect of him can be redeemable or salvageable or tempting because he's a demon and demons are bad. And yet, out of some sort of strange YA obligation, he's almost never written about that. Sex cave diversion. So, yeah, at the end of the book, Jake has made this deal with Beth in exchange for not throwing Xavier off a cliff or sort of reversing throwing Xavier off a cliff. He gets to have sex with her. Because Jake is obsessed with Beth, he makes this a romantic event in his eyes, with her wearing a bridal-style dress and him himself, like, in a tailcoat. He takes her to a far-off cave. 
They travel down a river of milky white water full of candles and rose petals to this, like, glamorous candlelit cave room. There's a luxurious king-sized bed, candles burning everywhere, mood lighting, a statue of Venus de Milo weeping blood, you know, everything romantic that you could want in your sex cave. The scene of him getting ready to have sex with her is way too drawn out. It's, um, there's quite a lot of detail and it goes on for quite a while. And then it's broken by a car breaking through the wall. For some reason, when given a magic sword that can open a portal to hell, the Earth Gang decided they need to go fetch the car first and drive that in. I suppose a special sword could just locate Beth easily and let them drive right into the wall she's in, but it's still pretty weird how a car is able to drive directly through a solid stone wall and send debris everywhere like it's this cheap movie prop. And this is not the first time walls have been busted either. Halo, in fact, is a series known for this cool aid man style entrances. Like, at the end of book one, the Angel siblings bust through a wall of a house to save Beth. In this book, Archangel Michael arrives via wall, shattering every window of the house as he does so. And then at the very end, the Angel siblings again burst through a wall to save Beth. Also, at this point, you know, Jake is stabbed by Gabriel and dies, but honestly, it feels so inconsequential. It's so inconsequential that in my first draft of the review, I forgot to even mention that he died at that point because it, it just passed my mind and everything else. A very Christian idea is that of repenting and saving, um, there's a lot of forgiveness, um, suffering because eventually it will be rewarded, that sort of thing are all Christian ideas. And the series though is not about repenting and saving at all. I mean, I complained about morality earlier of last book, about how the goodness of the town was heavily based on how many people went to church, not even if they went for the right reasons or were doing good things. I mean it's really said again that it was just because the angels were hot. And to me that takes all the free will out of the occasion. I like to think that the whole point of humanity is our free will, and the decision to be a good person being born from that. So in Hell, Beth runs into a friend who died last book named Taylor. Like all of Beth's friends, strangely, she's part of the popular vain cheerleader type clique. She was murdered last book by Jake, it didn't matter, I didn't mention it. And yeah, she is in hell. I hope it's not too strange that I want to focus on that and that I find it objectionable. Taylor and her crew are all a bit like bitchy fashion boy craze stereotypes, but they're 17 and they're not evil. They're not even particularly bullies, and even then, I don't think that bullying means an instant ticket to hell. I think that, in fact, bullying being an instant ticket to hell would be a very non-Christian idea. So Taylor explains why she's in hell. In life, she never really believed in anything higher than her and sinned without a second thought. This doomed her to hell, the nightclubs where she says demons treated her like a piece of meat, and now in these wastelands outside hell that she escaped to, where she wanders aimlessly avoiding rabid hellhounds who will drag her to a lake of fire and more endless torture. All this because she was not really that religious, and was a teenager. She's 17. She does share, though, that she had a greater sin, which might be why she's in hell. When she was 15, she was dating an 18-year-old, who she was in love with, and all the girls were jealous she'd won his attention. One night, he was drunk driving and hit and killed a young boy. Taylor didn't report him. A few months later, they broke up and he moved away, but she still didn't say anything out of fear of the social stigma she faced. To me, this isn't so much a sin as the book gravely states it is. The difference between an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old in high school is quite immense in age gap, really. Taylor felt mature and obsessed over and loved by a guy who was clearly taking advantage of her. He was drinking and driving carelessly. He's the one who hit the kid, and you can bet he's the one who pressured her to help cover it up. When he left, she didn't say anything out of fear and shame. I mean, with him gone, she was the only one to take the blame for a death that still haunted her. It's a crime, and it's bad, but it's not really her fault. You know, it, it sucks, and I think that 
She's somebody who deserves redemption, perhaps, or a chance to work better. You know, it's just not the kind of thing that I think means she should be doomed to hell to be raped and tortured by demons for all eternity, you know? It just bothered me a lot. Taylor hasn't a chance to escape to Earth to be a ghost in this book, but she sacrifices it to help Beth. She's mauled by hellhounds and taken away, presumably to the Lake of Fire that we see earlier, where all these horrible medieval hell punishments take place. And she's not referenced again? <laughs> Beyond just, like, the case of Taylor, it still has the same level of preaching to it. Much mention is made of characters in exposing outfits. From best friends, presumably all hellbound again, showing skin in their Halloween costumes, to Asia and the demons of hell, who participate in public sex and post dinner orgies. This is contrasted by Beth. For Halloween, she's an angel with this long, basic white dress, and in hell, she wears old fashioned gowns with long sleeves. So, in fact, Jake really is deeply in love and obsessed with Beth. And he's the one who buys her a bunch of old-timey, like, old, long, white nightgowns and things like that. He's obsessed with your, her purity. She's rewarded for her purity. And, in fact, in contrast to Asia, his, like, semi-girlfriend who wears, you know, exposing clothes, he only cares about Beth. Sex is a sin and purity is important, is the message. And sex is brought up more in this book. More than once, Jake wants to have sex with Bethany, and she rebukes him, leading him to say he really wants to, you know, make love, not have sex. The book's insights into sex really illuminate, like, its attributes. I think that this book would call me a homophobic slur if it could, and that really feels true. This is something Beth says. You're supposed to have sex with the person you love, the person you trust, the person you hope will one day be the father of your children, Beth yells. You know, to be fair, she's rejecting Jake, who has insisted she'd, you know, pay the deal she made for Xavier's life with sex. But still. The purpose of sex is to create life, I corrected him. In sleeping with you, I'd be committing to you, making a statement that I trust you, that I want to create life with you. With you, I repeated for emphasis. And again, that's a direct quote from towards the end of the book. So I'm asexual. Um, I don't really care about sex or plan to have it or anything like that. And that doesn't mean that I can't be really, really annoyed by this rhetoric. Purity culture is a dangerous thing for young girls. It puts all this emphasis on sex and on virginity. And then when they do have sex, they often feel impure and deeply ashamed. When it's a case of rape or abuse, it's, you know, doubly so, that sort of shame and impurity. The problem isn't the idea of waiting for someone special or wanting your first sexual experience to be with someone you love. That's fine. It's that sex is the most important thing ever. That's the troubling idea. Beth even worried she'd be tainted by letting Jake have sex with her, which is that exact sort of thing. The idea that you can be tainted in any sort of way is a bad rhetoric. You can be hurt, but you cannot be permanently ruined by, you know, that sort of thing. And it's such a bad idea that it really bothers me. And indeed, Beth's ideas of sex are very much on the idea that sex is only to have babies. She talks about how sex is about committing. It's about, you know, the person you hope will father your children. That you want to create life. That is the point of sex. And, um, you know, it should be also pointed out that the argument that sex only exists to create life and for the sake of babies. Well, we, we all know that that's pretty much only an argument against, like, gay people, right? Like, it's there to stop horny teenagers, but it's very heavily and mostly used as a reason to discount gay people from being allowed to exist. Talking about Jake so far, I have... I've avoided going too much into one of the most important details about this book. And let's again remember the whole he's written as a love interest even though he's not really a love interest thing. Because Jake Thorne is a Nazi. <laughs> like, literally. This book teaches us a lot about Jake. He's a whiny entitled baby, he's been alive since the dawn of time, 
And he's a Nazi. I mean, the lore is frankly overflowing. Anyway, I need to talk to you about one segment of this book, about a hundred pages in, which shocked me so much. My literal notes, my literal notes at the time, were just, you cannot do this in your YA paranormal romance. You cannot do this, in all caps. So, Beth talks to her shy hell maid, Hannah, about Hannah's life as a human and how she wound up here in hell. And it starts very alarmingly with... It starts, this is a quote, it starts in Butchenwald, which I hope I'm pronouncing right, and um, you and the angel Beth may just be on the same page in your reply, because that response is the concentration camp? But there are more twists ahead. You see, not only is our Christian angel paranormal romance novel taking us to Nazi Germany, and the Holocaust, it's taking us to the other side, because Hannah was a Hitler youth. Which actually was an all-boys group, but you can't ask the author to Google more than one fact before she, like, vomits up the rest of the book. So, Hannah, f friend made Hannah, was a Nazi teen working in a concentration camp to help the guards. She expressed that she knows times were bad and what was going on, you know, like, like genocide, but also that her family was poor and she was planning to leave soon. Like, <laughs> Hannah, I was just following orders, whatever her last name is, that's what we call her. So one day, Hannah sees an old childhood friend of hers, who Hannah helpfully calls a Jew. For those missing me pointing that out, Jew has notably been used derogatory, especially by Nazis, so you should use is Jewish or Jewish person. A Jewish person might say or refer to themselves as a Jew, but the phrasing of just a Jew by itself has a very historical negative connotation, and it's not correct, and uh, it is what's used in this book. So, old Jewish friend is in the concentration camp and getting sick. Hannah doesn't want to show her face to the old friend lest she be judged for being a Nazi. Hannah meets a Nazi officer, Jake Thorne, who says he can help old friend. He reveals he works for a higher master, and if she made a deal, she would be rewarded with everlasting life for her loyalty, aka selling her soul. She accepts the deal. Jake Thorne, through magic or I don't know, I don't know what, cures old friend's illness. However, as Hannah bitterly notes, this does nothing to change the fact that her old friend in two weeks' time is taken to the gas chambers. And you, you can't do this in your YA paranormal romance trilogy novel. You cannot do this. <laughs> like, I've mentioned Jake is the villain, not the love interest, but I've also pointed out that the narrative is sometimes muddled on how to treat him. His past as a Nazi during the Holocaust is not mentioned again, nor is it any point of horror for Beth. Beth instead focuses more on the fact he tricked Hannah by saving her friend only to let her die, rather than any acknowledgement of the Holocaust. The goddamn Holocaust. To bring that into your stupid young adult novel is absolutely offensive. It's it's actually worse to make it such a minor detail. Like, Hannah's tragic backstory of betrayal and a... It's, it's about betrayal and this lost soul rather than the Holocaust. It's absolutely belittering to the many, many lives lost. It, it's belittering to her old friend, who's kind of there as a prop for Hannah's sad growth. Like, on another... Okay. On another spectrum of offense. I, I vaguely mentioned this earlier, but I want to talk about Asia. So Asia is the only not-white character we've seen in the Halo universe, despite the book series taking place in Georgia, a state in the South that has a very heavy black population and, and general minority population. Asia is black. Every time she's mentioned, her skin is chocolate or coffee-colored. Yikes. She is bitchy and jealous. Um, She's Jake's very personal assistant who pines after him nonstop. But of course, Jake is lovesick for Beth, her pure angel soul, not caring at all about Asia. 
So, you know, poor Asia. She wears halter tops and strips down to, like, black underwear, having sex with strangers for information without a thought, sometimes talking in this slight accent. There's a lot of sass, a lot of wildness, and, like, a whole lot of racism. I don't know how clear I have to be about, like, what racism is and why it's bad, but Asia obviously stands as a sort of stereotype of a sexually promiscuous black woman who, you know, only cares for sex and is mean but jealous of the pure, good, Christian, white girl. It's always a problem when a world only features, like, white people, but I just knew the moment there was someone who wasn't, it was gonna end poorly. <laughs> This is a world where beauty is very much in the skin. The whiteness, goldenness, and shiningness of our heroes' skin is frequent and always linked to their beauty. The demons are called beautiful themselves in this ugly way, but when Beth peers at them, she sees they really are ugly. They're misshapen with missing hair and teeth, they're gross-looking people. Um, and again, in contrast, the main character, white hair, um, white skin, Blonde hair, blue eyes, her siblings are the same way. Like, this is what angels look like. They're the most beautiful, perfect people ever. These Aryan stereotypes. YA literature, to this day, has such a problem with beauty and how ugliness, you know, and God forbid, like, uncommon facial features is evil. And it's really concerning and it still goes on. So, yeah, poor Asia, you know, too. Yet another side character here just to be disrespected. And she's also entirely in the right the entire book. She points out how Jake has been obsessing over Beth, how foolish he's acting, how Beth needs to get out. And this is all very true, but Asia is still just this rude, evil, non-person to the story. She doesn't appear in book three. I mentioned that Lucifer is called Big Daddy, right? You remember that, right? You haven't forgotten that Lucifer is Big Daddy? Okay, okay, good. So, this fact is introduced so casually. When Big Daddy fell from grace, a character starts. Beth questions this and the character reveals, well, I suppose you'd call him Satan or Lucifer. Like, that explains anything. All the demons in hell, all eight of the fallen angels who fell with Lucifer in the rebellion, all the human thralls, they call Satan Big Daddy without an ounce of irony. <laughs> I don't like it. It gets weirder when we meet Lucifer. As said, Jake took Beth to be his bride in the circle of hell which he controls, but he had Lucifer's permission first. This act was meant to be a prompt for war, for heaven to attack hell outright and start the apocalypse. Jake, however, is personally obsessed with Beth. It's common Nate like knowledge in his circle. In fact, how much he wants Beth, how upset he is Beth rejected him. One demon laments the other circles are making fun of his circle because of this, which I think is entirely valid. Jake's childishness is brought out to the extreme when Lucifer gets directly involved. After Beth creates a butterfly out of light in public, the other fallen call a council to decide Beth's fate, as bringing hope and light into hell is an unforgivable crime. Jake is impetuously demanding Beth stay with him as the demons and fallen question his judgment. Then Lucifer intercedes. I should note this whole meeting is for some reason in a grimy abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of hell, even though these are the people who control hell. Lucifer wears a white suit with a red tie. He carries an ivory-tipped cane and wears embroidered cowboy boots. His skin is weather-beaten and leathery. He looks slightly old, weird for an angel, but Beth concludes evil makes you age. His silver hair is tied back in a ponytail. He doesn't sound it, but Beth concludes he's kind of overall still hot. Lucifer is so hard to pin down as a character in this book, but he sure does call himself daddy in the third person. The other fallen call him father, an odd take considering the fallen were his followers into hell, more like work buddies, if anything. Yet another reason not to do crime with your co-workers. The ringleader does legally become your parent at the end of it. Jake demands he gets to keep Beth, saying she's his, she's young, he'll smooth everything over. Lucifer denies this, acting a lot like a dad preventing a toddler from buying a toy. There's something pseudo-sexual about the whole big daddy thing. Like, he's a mix of their father and sugar daddy. 
Of course, the origin of the daddy complex is simply that God in heaven is called Father, and Lucifer considers himself a false, better, bigger god. The use of daddy presumably shows the demons are far more casual and profane. I've spared very little talk for the angel siblings, uh, Xavier and the friend Molly. That's because they do very little in Hades. They wait around, the message being that heaven likes to keep you waiting, and after running an errand, they get the sort of due sex machina and instantly save Beth. There's a lot of chapters where Beth just astral projects to follow them sitting around, at one point five times in a row. And that's sort of it. I should note that, like, last book, the friend Molly had this crush on Gabriel. Molly is portrayed as a vapid party girl, but she crushed on, you know, the perfect hot excellent Archangel Gabriel last book so hard that she stopped wearing makeup and tried to do more volunteering. Gabriel would be actually my favorite character in these books, I guess. He's, he's very boring and stoic much of the time, but every so often he explains what a MILF is and is totally uninterested in, like, sex or romance, and I can really get behind that. So, in Hades, Molly's continues her crush, even after learning Gabriel is an angel. She kiss kisses him, leading to these three solid pages of these absolute savagery that I just need to address. So, Gabriel, you see, does not kiss back. He is firm and immobile. Molly, a paragraph of pure ecstasy, the explosion and fever she feels kissing him. Gabriel, a waxwork. His face is sad, pitying her, looking at her like she's a weird problem he has to solve. I do not possess human sentiment, he explains. She complains if he feels like anything at all, if he's some robot. I lack the capacity to give the love you speak of. When she points out Beth is right there, full of love for Xavier, Gabriel begins to enter roast mode. Because I am not like Bethany. I am not young and inexperienced. But I love you, cries Molly, miserably. If you think you love me, then you do not know what love is, Gabriel said. Love has to be reciprocated for it to be real. This is a heavy hit. Molly does not stop, though. She wonders if it's her body, her soul. What's wrong with her, she wonders. Gabriel tells her to accept what he's saying and move on. And quite clearly, I'm saying you're behaving like a child, because that is exactly what you are. I mean, hell yeah, she is. She's 17. He's an angel from the dawn of creation. Like, this, this cannot work. Molly continues to ask why Gabriel doesn't want to make out with her. Is it something she did? No, it's what she is, he corrects. You are human, my brother's eyes flashed. It's in your nature to be lustful, greedy, envious, deceitful, and proud. All your life you will fight against those instincts. My father gave you free will. He chose you to rule his earth, and look what you have done with it. This world is in ruins, and I am here only to restore his glory. I have no other purpose and no other interest. Do you think I am so weak as to be seduced by a doe-eyed human who is barely more than a child? I am different from you in every possible way. I can only try to understand your ways, and never, not in a thousand years, will you come close to understanding mine. So that is why, Molly, your efforts here are useless. Molly, the most determined teen in the world, does not ap accept this absolute burn, but begins to accept the argument is done. And I know this seems like a really useful aside, but it was just, it's so funny to me. It's this way too long, extremely brutal, and almost entirely for not seen, because in book three they have a bit more romance chemistry, that serves no real purpose, but Archangel Gabriel just slam dunking on this girl. <laughs> I don't know what happened to bring us book three and all the sheer insanity that is inside it. Something happened to the author. So, book three, out of hell, Bethany and Xavier ended the last book on a proposal. Thunder rumbled ominously and a small earthquake shakes the town. Xavier still thinks they should get married immediately, so they rush to the church and 
get married. The priest asks if they're sure, since they're both about 18 and show up without rings and in school uniforms, but Beth tells him it's God's will and he becomes really kind of serious and accepts. At the end of the marriage ceremony, an angel of death walks through the doors of the church and gives the priest a heart attack, killing him slowly as Beth and Xavier watch. The Reaper warns them about the consequences of their actions. Personally, if I wanted our heroes not to be married, I'd kill the priest before they got married. The angel siblings, Gabriel and Ivy, turn up and start speeding away from town, just rushing Xavier and Beth just out of town because I guess God can't see fast cars. You know, they scold Bethany and Xavier for their rash decision to get married. So now they must flee as they're already being hunted by heaven. An angel can't marry a human. I mean, an angel can date a human though, evidently, since she's been doing that for two books without being scolded. God, in fact, approved them dating, but just isn't committed to them getting married. Gabriel also tells them they shouldn't have sex, a statement they are both quite offended by. As book two taught us, sex is only for reproduction, so I'm surprised how quickly they want to have kids, apparently. I mean, surely last book didn't include that as a rhetoric it had no intention of following. After a few weeks of laying around in this cabin in the woods being insufferable, one of the evil angels hunting them shows up. We learn these are the Sevens, a voluntary order of elite military angels who intervene in internal angel affairs. They all have ghastly white skin, no eyes or mouth, just sheared, sealed up orifices, and wear black suits. They are the silence from Doctor Who. You know, those villains from one of the worst of Moffat's many horrible arcs. They are our villains. Anyways, Beth shows power she never has before, becoming angry enough to become one with the molecules around her and throw a brick really well, snapping the Seven's neck slightly. She shoves the seven into a log cabin, and with her mind sets it ablaze. (laughs) I don't know. So cabin life wasn't working, apparently, so the angel siblings relocate Xavier and Beth to college. Evidently, the best place is to hide, like, is among humans. Yet it also wasn't the angel siblings' first choice. At college, they have fake names and identities, and have to pretend to be siblings. They get the go-ahead from Gabriel to have sex. Cool. So they do. Unprotected in the middle of the woods. This college section is so weird and doesn't last that long, but contains so many insane details. It's mostly here so that Beth will be very jealous possessive about Xavier. Molly will reappear with her weird cult fiancé. And there's just a concerning amount of incest-based flirting and drama. Beth uses her weird, sudden powers to seal the lips of a classmate shut and extract her memories. I- I'm not- I'm not. <laughs> The Sevens, they show up in class at one day and they kill Xavier. Xavier's death is short-lived, but it's long enough for Lucifer to possess him. The next 15% of the book contain this Lucifer possession plotline, which leads nowhere and achieves really nothing. He's there. He makes Gabriel have his wings torn to bits, and he's exorcised. Next sudden tirade is the revelation that Xavier isn't human, and a whole bunch of lore that's really too late in the book to be introduced. Xavier, a halfling, is the result of divine interception by Ivy, giving him special abilities the Sevens now want to abduct him to study. (laughs) I don't know. Molly's cult fiancé, meanwhile, is in a cult. We have a large chunk about this story where she's being abused, but neither of her friends think they should intervene in the abuse until Gabriel dramatically saves her and they kiss. The plot begins to, like, draw to a close now, somehow. It's hard to call this a plot. Beth is abducted into heaven. To escape, she has her wings cut off by a secret underground, slightly rebellious group called the Dark Angels. With her wings gone, Beth is human and returns to Earth. She reunites with Xavier. The end. And you might be like, that sounds janky as all hell. And yeah, 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 yes it is. (laughs) The premise of this book is that Beth and Xavier get married, and Heaven's not down with that. 
it's the basic idea that in theory runs the story. I don't know why their marriage is illegal and the book doesn't explain it at all. There's not really even a section or quote I can point you towards here. I, I plainly don't understand why this is the case and the book doesn't either. Bethany wasn't allowed to date Xavier in book one or fall in love with him, but the angels were told by a high authority, as in God, that it was okay. God has said their relationship is fine. I mean, they just broke them, like, Beth out of hell so that she could be with Xavier. But their marriage is apparently forbidden. Uh, my theory on this links back to marriage being a deep tie to another person and Beth as an angel not being allowed to have free will. She exists to do a job, and tying herself to another person might be putting a person above her work. But Beth as an angel has never done anything angelic, ever, anyways. The military order who hunts them down wants them to uh, split them up, I guess? Like, divorce isn't an option here. They want to pry the couple apart or kill one or the other, though their goals are never consistent from appearance to appearance. This makes the driving force of the story exceptionally weak. Like, at least in Hades, we always knew she wanted to get out of hell. As a married couple, Beth and Xavier are pretty much the same beyond talking about their exciting dream of having three children and a white picket fence. Beth doesn't have any dreams beyond being his wife. They spend an insufferable conversation discussing baby names. Xavier wants bland, bland names, despite his own, while Beth is also dishing up common names, but Xavier hates all of them. Like Dakota? Oh, that's the name of a place. Billy? No, she'll grow up gender confused. Real, real quote that. Xavier's ideal boy names are Sam and Josh, by the way, which is the names of my horrible siblings, so you know he has piss poor judgment. While in college, Bethany and Xavier are pretending to be siblings, and it's so, so uncomfortable, and I need to highlight that if this book has any running threads, it's incest that isn't incest. Shortly before they have sex, for the first time, Xavier is kissing Bethany and she, she, she teases him with, that isn't very brotherly behavior, which is disgusting. <laughs> Later, they're caught hardcore making out by Bethany's roommate, who is horrified and rejects their attempts to explain what's going on and that they're not actually siblings. This is the part where Bethany uses her sudden body horror magic and erases her memories. When Xavier learned Ivy helped create him technically, he asks if Ivy is his mother and Bethany would thus be his aunt. When Ivy and the angel Raphael flirt, Beth... <laughs> and, you know, Beth also... <laughs> I'm sorry, I hate, I hate this. When Ivy and the angel Raphael, who shows up briefly, flirt, and at one point Bethany also learns Xavier's part angel, she reassures the reader that angels aren't technically brothers and sisters, they just call each other that. So there isn't any incest in this book, but there's a real theme of people telling me none of this is incest, which is not a good sign and generally not something you should ever need to clarify. Like, also with the marriage, sex, let's talk about it. Last book, Bethany told us that sex is only for reproduction, but Xavier and her both agree they aren't ready for kids just yet. So huh, that moral was quickly forgotten. They meet up in the woods during their college hideout to, you know, get hot and heavy, but Xavier realizes he doesn't have a condom and they should stop. Beth wonders if he doesn't find her attractive anymore, goading him to have sex anyway, so they do. Great. Christian role model book, you know, go go teach kids that unprotected sex is a sign of true love. The sex scene is funny stuff because it's not at all explicit what's going on, but also so obvious it's sex. Lots of emotions and kissing and stuff, and metaphors and bad writing. Um, here's a couple extracts from the sex scene. Just <laughs> phrases. A magical underwater world. Feeling my veins pulsating with supernatural energy. Feeling like I was filling up like a balloon until I was about to burst. When a dam breaks, what can you do to stem the torrent of water? 
Perhaps the water can be redirected, but it can never go back to being contained. I, I think that one's about cum. At the end of the book, Beth is a human, so I suppose it solves the problem of their marriage being forbidden. However, she's still a rebel angel, even if an ex-one, like, who wronged heaven and the angel police, so I'm not totally sure she's in the clear yet. The bad guys in this book are principalities, the Sevens. You might know them as the Order of Angels Aziraphale belongs to in Good Omens, the order that watches over nations and groups of people. In this book, principalities are the Seventh Order or Sevens, an elite military order which serves as Heaven's watchdogs and secret enforcement agents. Though once regular angels, they somehow now lack an understanding of ways of humans and emotions. Sevens appear as men without eyes or mouths, just fused flesh and wear business suits and appeal to be modern. As said, they look like the Doctor Who monsters, the Silence, to an exact degree, and this book did come out a year after they were introduced. For unknown reasons, the Seventh leader is an angel who looks just like a regular dude. He's also our second person of color, being black. The Seventh's arrival is always forewarned with an omen, such as a blood moon or a ghostly white horse. <laughs> Generally, I always find the best secret militias are those marked by dark omens. <laughs> so, the Sevens are known to be rogue, perhaps acting more rogue in this book. They interrupt a class at Beth and Xavier's college without disguising themselves, fully prepared and threatening to kill the humans there. They refuse suggestions from the other angel government bodies, the Arch and the Covenant, not to do this. When Beth wonders why God isn't doing anything about this military force that at one point even kills Xavier, everyone just vaguely kind of answers God is busy lately. Satan's gathering forces and like he really only cares about Earth. Angel Affairs and Heaven is a godless wasteland, this book posits, where faceless military troops can decide to single-mindedly try and destroy a marriage and no one can stop them. I feel like back in the day we just threw rebels into hell, right? Like, wh why haven't we done that yet with these guys? The Seven's exact goals change throughout the book, and they generally drop in and out of existence in the story to reflect this. At first they want the marriage dissolved, and even after multiple times trying to talk this over with Bethany, who always uses light powers or brick arson combos to refuse them. At this, like, certain point, then they're trying to kill Xavier and or Bethany, then only Xavier. When Xavier learns he's special, they want to kidnap him to become, like, a lab rat? And at the climax, they use a human hostage to demand surrender, and they're only interested in kidnapping Bethany now back to heaven. The Sevens do not appear in heaven at all, and after getting Bethany up there, I'm, like, not sure what they're doing. Their goals are so inconsistent, they're so bizarre as villains. You know, by the end of the book, when Bethany cuts off her wings and becomes human, I'm not sure if they're satisfied with how things work out, or if they're gonna come for Xavier again. They did suddenly start calling him an elect, and then never explained what that meant, so maybe God's just like finally marked him as exempt from, you know, kidnapping slash murder. Around 68% into this book, there comes a series of revelations which are from nowhere and mean and meant like just absolutely nothing. The first is that Xavier isn't human. Some Sevens taunt him about this, how he isn't, and it's the first ever reference to the idea he wouldn't be. The Angel siblings come clean shortly after. Xavier isn't human, and they have always known this. Ivy tells a story. Twenty years ago, Ivy was on Earth and came across a couple who weren't having luck conceiving. Ivy blessed them, giving the woman fertility, and throwing in a fetus for good measure. Just right in there. Ivy explains the couple had a son, and then went on to have four more children, and that Heaven warned her this random miracle would come back to her. She'd meet that boy again, and he would merge with the world of angels. Beth and Xavier are astounded by this, but Beth especially. This is roughly how Beth reacts. Wow, do you think we're gonna meet him? Gabriel says, you already have. Beth, I don't understand. I, I don't know, Beth. 
Have you tried asking your boyfriend, who you just learned was special, if he knows any other boys who are nearly 20, live in the South, and have four younger siblings? Besides himself, of course. Ivy's miracle baby, Xavier, inherited divine essence from Ivy. Immaculate conception babies such as this have happened before and always end up with some non-explainable powers, but no one in heaven actually knows where these kids are or register them in any way. These special kids are divine blessed, making them both fully human, but also an angel. Some sort of 100% 100% split. Xavier is the first angel humans the Sevens have ever learned of, which is why they now want to kidnap him for... testing. I don't know what they're testing for. These divine people are called halflings. Like they're, you know, hobbits or the D&D &D race or something. And it turns out also Xavier has special powers. He, well, he has, he can control, I mean, okay, no, no, he can't really control or do jack shit. Uh, look, he's deeply tied to all four elements, apparently. Water, earth, fire, air. Only Xavier, gifted with all four elements, can, um, make Bethany think of those elements when she focuses on him, I, I guess? His powers do nothing and only appear in one scene, just as him having special powers does not impact the plot in any way. When Beth learns he's special, she can suddenly sense how this is the case, but that is literally it. Him being a halfling has no payoff, nor does it help or hinder the plot beyond the Sevens for a very short time wanting to kidnap instead of kill him. And this is after they've already killed him once. Bethany remarks how there were always signs of this twist, which there weren't. But apparently, despite having a lot of trauma in his life, he never broke down, and he was able to break into hell to save her, using that sword Archangel Michael gave him. That's all she can come up with as, like, foreshadowing, and as you again should recall, he really did nothing at all. He... <laughs> He didn't break into hell in some epic way, he just hung out with the angel siblings and waited. She also realizes that him being a special halfling must be why she fell in love with him, because angels aren't meant to fall in love with humans. But he's not really human. But that message sort of invalidates the whole idea of their forbidden, inexplicable, god-blessed special love. It's not because the two of them and their romance is special that Bethany can fall for a human. It's just because, like, whatever, because Xavier isn't a human, so that's, like, one less barrier to cross. It invalidates the entire purpose of, like, the paranormal romance as a whole, as a genre, of the forbidden romance between a supernatural and a human person. If you say, oh, no, the only reason we were capable of falling in love in the first place is because you secretly weren't human. I have no idea why this twist exists, and dear God, it's... It's really, really funny, but also the most inexplicable thing I think I maybe have ever seen in a book. Lucifer is back in book three. Yeah, I, I wish he was the highlight of this book, but he isn't, because there's no real highlight I can draw out of book three, Heaven. But he's back, and I'm excited to see him. As I said, Xavier is killed by the Sevens during a lecture hall. Bethany stands defiantly by his body as his confused spirit emerges, and she and the Grim Reaper have a standoff, like a la two divorcees trying to coax a dog to either side in a courtroom. Beth orders Xander's spirit to come to her, and it does, returning to his body and bringing him back to life. However, oops, despite being dead for a minute and probably heaven-bound, Lucifer somehow snuck into his body. Like, if it's that easy, why isn't Lucifer and every other demon in a human's body at all time? The world is full of people who are near death or brought back via medical means. Lucifer in this book serves no purpose, and he's here for about 15%, like several chapters. In Xavier's body, he acts entirely bizarre, but also quite docile, willingly hanging out with the Angel family, despite them all knowing he's possessed Xavier from the start. He barely resists being restrained and kept in a basement, where the angel siblings pray for divine help in exercising him. Despite Lucifer seeming like a big priority, I mean, it's, it's friggin' Lucifer, it's Big Daddy, heaven is such a mess that no one comes along and deals with them. 
Maybe the sevens actually would have been useful right about now. I mean, the actual devil is hanging out on Earth and no one is doing anything. This leads Lucifer to try and make a deal. And this is a really rough summary of the conversation. <laughs> Lucifer says, Hey, I'll let Zave go if you summon the spirit of my son, Jake Thorne. I'm sorry, I'm going to do the worst. Accent. Why did I start doing that? I'm so sorry. It's because he's called Big Daddy and he wears cowboy boots. I, I, I want to apologize to everybody with a southern accent because I don't know what that was that just escaped me. Lucifer himself. Big Daddy came into my bar. <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. I, I'm quite tired, apparently, and absolutely nonsense. Look, here's what Lucifer says when he's trying to make his friggin' deal, okay? Lucifer. Hey, I'll let Xavier go if you summon the spirit of my son, Jake Thorne. And Beth considers it. Hmm. The angel siblings all say, hey, don't, don't do that, actually. That's, don't, don't make a deal with the devil. Lucifer says, he really liked you, so you can do it if you just say his name. I want you to give Jake something he really wants. Then you can have Xavier back. It'll be fine. This is what Lucifer says, you know? He's so friendly. And Beth considers it. She says, hmm... But what if I don't like what Jake wants? What if I don't want to do what Jake wants? And Lucifer just says, eh, you can refuse him then. I mean, who cares? The angel siblings are on the sideline of this conversation saying like, hey, hey don't, don't make that deal, Beth. He's the devil. But Lucifer again just says, I, I just want to say goodbye to my son, Jake Thorne. And so Beth is swayed by this. She says, well, I, I do want Xavier back. So, okay, Jake Thorne. And you might think this is a trick, because Lucifer, I mean, Big Daddy is the devil, but it's not. I mean, it's not a twist. It's not anything, this whole weird conversation. What should be the twist here is that, you know, Beth accidentally revives Jake Thorne, or lets him possess her body, or Xavier's body, or whatever. It's actually nothing. Lucifer just wants to say goodbye to his son, Jake Thorne, even though they're the same age and basically co-workers, his son, Jake Thorne. That's it. So Jake Thorne's ghost shows up. I, I didn't realize Angel's got ghosts, but he does. He stands in the corner mostly, though Lucifer asks his opinion on what he should trade Xavier's life for. Jake suggests Gabriel's wings, and that's it. Jake Thorne, b beloved character, he has his fangirls, literal Nazi Jake Thorne, is here as a weird cameo, like as if people would riot if he didn't show up in book three. And Gabriel agrees to this deal. Ivy points out demons aren't known for keeping deals. I mean, last book there were two instances of demons explicitly breaking deals. Yet Gabriel solemnly says this is not a trick. He allows a swarm of imp demons to chew and claw his wings to tatters, while Jake Thorne watches, exact quote, like a little boy at a pantomime. <laughs> then Archangel Raphael shows up, scares off the imps, and exercises Lucifer with ease. He was likely summoned by Ivy and Beth, who held hands and prayed as Gabriel suffered, yet that feels kind of thin as an excuse. Like, why wait until after the event to send help when Lucifer has been in this basement for days? Heaven, again, is apparently a godless wasteland. Either they couldn't scurry together the paperwork to save the wings of one of their best archangels, or God just really wanted Gabriel to suffer. Lucifer is never mentioned again after the scene, even though during his time on Earth he makes some reference to Hell's plans and anger. In fact, if Hell was trying to start the apocalypse, I mean, they never got around to that, and they sure never get around to it by the end of the book. All of that stuff in book two, and this reference here, is never brought up again. It's utterly strange and a real waste of Big Daddy. Darkness is really descending on me in this recording, but I just want to get done with this review and I'll have to do it tomorrow. Uh, most of the bulbs in this room have broken and I don't have any lighting in this house because most of our lights are in fact broken. So I'm just going to keep, like, I'm just going to keep going despite the um, approaching darkness. <laughs> Wingless Gabriel is another plot point that isn't explored or featured. He becomes sort of moody and emotional. And into Molly, you know, that 17-year-old girl. Now she's 18, so it's fine. 
In fact, at one point, Molly visits post-Lucifer, and the two passionately make out. Ivy and Beth conclude this erratic behavior is because of his damaged wings, which harmed his divine essence. He's questioning his faith, the eternal war, and the methods of God, much to Beth and Ivy's horror. Also, kissing, you know, Molly, you know, this 18-year-old girl he first met under the guise of being a high school music teacher, and Molly, who is currently engaged. Because Molly's in a cult in this book. While Beth and Xavier were fleeing from the Sevens, she met and became engaged to a man named Wade, who's in a Christian extremist cult and is also abusive towards her. Um, you know, definitely subjects I'm sure are going to be handled with careful care. So Wade's cult confuses me. For one, the tenants we see are mostly aspects from real fundamentalist Christian beliefs such as wives being subservient to women, mainstream media being a tool of the devil, conservative fashion, avoiding makeup, and not talking to unmarried men. So the contrast between this cult and a lot of the views the book actually shows are not as sharp as they should be. The idea that women should be obedient to their husbands is a something Xavier is aghast by, even though the actual viewpoint of the book is that women should be, you know, taking on lesser roles in society than their husbands. Beth is not subservient to him, but her whole role is to support Xavier, be protected by Xavier, and her whole dream is to have a, you know, housewife sort of role. Obviously, there is a difference but what I feel is that there's not as wide of a difference as the book seems to think there is. What we actually see of this cult in action is very limited besides a bunch of women kneeling in this campus chapel and Molly, like, in her underwear getting her hair cut off. Which, I mean, I'll grant you that's not part of Christian belief. But I need to talk basically about the abuse Molly faces this book and mostly just talk about our main good Christian couple of this angel and this special angel boy, okay? So Molly meets up with them for lunch, and she's dressed totally different. You know, very covering old-style clothes than she normally would. She's slightly nervous and shy, compared to how she's always been this gossiping loud girl. There's a bruise on her wrist, like she's been grabbed with extreme force, but she claims she just fell down the stairs. Her fiancé, Wade, arrives suddenly and says he can smell she's wearing lip gloss and forces her to throw it away. Molly invites our heroes to dinner, but Wade's body language shows a quiet anger even when his words say she can go out to dinner with them. The heroes decline dinner and she leaves to go to um, Bible study with Wade. There's so many red flags, but none of those are red flags for Beth and Xavier. They remark that it's weird, and Beth kind of wonders if they should do anything. But Xavier says Molly's an adult and would clearly ask them if she needed help. Beth wonders if maybe she was trying to ask for help, but Xavier dismisses the idea. This continues when they meet up with the Angel siblings. When Beth casually says to, um, you know, her sister, Ivy, can you believe she, that he doesn't let her wear lip gloss? Ivy dismisses this with a, that makes him controlling, not a serial killer. Don't be so quick to judge. Beth wonders if they should interfere, but Ivy says it's none of their business. Again, we see Xavier express horror at the idea of women being subservient to men, and yet right here, Ivy says, it's fine if she's in a relationship with a controlling man who would throw away lip gloss and harass her about it. It's not that bad, don't judge him. You know, the signs could not be any more blatant that Molly is in a dangerous situation and is being physically and emotionally abused. But her only close friends, the majority of which are literal angels, dismiss this as something they should stay out of? Molly obviously needs help, and our heroes just ignore that. It's Gabriel, still very moody and erratic, and I guess into Molly, who intervenes and takes them to save Molly. Gabriel and Molly's relationship is unresolved and unanswered. Even here, where it seems like the entire plotline was created so Gabriel could save her and prove his love. They don't kiss again, and Beth thinks about how Gabriel's feelings will fade as his wings heal. So, I, I don't know what's going on here. 
And I never will, as this is the last reference to them as a couple. In many ways, this trilogy feels like there was supposed to be one more book. I, I don't know what that book would look like, but that would expand on Molly and Gabriel's relationship, on the Sevens, on the war with heaven and hell, on this... So this is a very scattered review, obviously. The whole trilogy, though, is just this scattered. There's a lot in this book, and yet absolutely nothing. There's a lot in the series, and yet absolutely nothing. So it's hard to comment on, and it's hard to really conclude. Halo as a trilogy is annoying. <laughs> I look at my various Bad Angel books that I've read, and each has this unique flavor. Halo's is annoying. The characters are bland. They're very much like wasps who have little to define each other, but like the true love that Beth and Xavier feel. There's not quite conflict in this book, or any of the books, as if the author is constantly trying to pick a villain or obstacle, but can't decide on who that should be. At the heart of it is Bethany, the world's worst teen angel wife. Bethany does not do anything. In the first book, she fell in love but had to be saved. In the second, she was taken to hell but had to be saved. In the third, she is directed by her siblings on where to hide and run to. At last, she does not need to, like, save herself, but even her big wing-shredding decision was not something she came up with herself. Someone else told her to do it, and so she did. Do you think there's a message to these books? Because by the end, I can't even find a Christian core in this Christian book. If you go through enough stupid events, eventually God will relent and the book will end. Is that the message? I think Christianity is, at some point, it's about suffering and how pain is going to be met for reward, but there's so little pain in these books either. Bethany and Xavier feel emotions only for a few paragraphs at a time, and despite how Bethany claims to have had nightmares from hell, even the home of torture was just a penthouse hotel room for her. She does not suffer, and she does not earn a reward. She does not help people or save them. In fact, her marriage murdered a priest quite literally, and indirectly somebody from Xavier's college. Bethany does net negative for the world, and we should all be thankful she's no longer in heaven. Though, judging by the unresolved unit of rogue special ops angels out there disobeying authority and God, I think we're not quite yet safe. A couple unresolved plot things I just need to talk about, and these are just small little nuggets of just things, because dear god. Um, I didn't talk about Zack. Zack is Bethany's angel best friend. I mean, you don't remember him? Well, he was only introduced, like, page 10 of the third book. He was a guardian angel who left to become a seven. You'd think this, with the Sevens being the villains of the book, would mean he'd be in charge of hunting Beth down, creating conflict from their past friendship. No, you fool. In heaven, Beth runs into him, and since he's quit being an angel, he's now just a helpful ally for one scene. Next bullet point. In heaven, a land of white clouds marked by literal golden gates, Beth is helped by a secret faction of angels known as Dark Angels, who want angels to have the right to give up being an angel and go become human. I think these guys are by definition extremely sacrilegious, but luckily nobody seems to be chucking angels into hell anymore. They're introduced 90% of the into the way of the book as a concept. Third point, um, in heaven, angels take the form of orbs of pure spirit, which is their true form. Beth's is only human shape because she's been on earth for two years and needs to transition back to being a being of pure light. Despite telling us this, all the named angels we see in heaven are people-shaped. Next point, I shouldn't even try to number these. Angels being pure light orbs makes a lot of things quite odd. Bethany, for one, lacks a belly button. 
Since she was art incarnated into skin from her pure energy form, why did she get made without such an obviously human trait? We learn in the final chapter, s seriously, that angels have golden blood. This whole, this whole trilogy, golden blood. Another dead giveaway of their inhumanity, and also weird since I don't think orbs bleed, so why are they being made into forms without belly buttons and golden blood? It's so obvious. Also, Zack the Angel says he only joined the Sevens because he was very drunk. Was he orb drinking? Why was he drinking? Does heaven have work and not work hours for angels? Or was he drinking on the job? Who's making alcohol for angels in heaven? <laughs> An another point. This is a direct quote, a direct quote from this book. I could hardly tell her all our energies had gone into keeping ourselves distracted so we wouldn't consummate our marriage, thereby incurring further heavenly wrath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I could hardly tell her all our energies had gone into keeping ourselves distracted so we wouldn't consummate our marriage, thereby incurring further heavenly wrath. That's what I do all the time. I'm always distracted. All of my energy. That's why I'm so ill all the time. I'm just distracted, trying not to consummate my marriage so heaven won't hate me. Unresolved plot points, by the way, uh, I've sort of mentioned them. Lucifer's plans for the end of the world, Molly Gabriel's romance, Wade being aided by other forces at one point, Xavier being inhuman, Xavier's powers, the Sevens, Gabriel's broken faith, while it was illegal for Zeph <laughs> Xavier and Beth to marry, 800 other things. Uh, at the end of Hades, um, this is a different point, but Beth sadly mentions again like how she wishes she could save Zav um, Hannah and Tucker. The two human souls, they're unresolved because they're just going to suffer in hell for all eternity. Um, final, final unresolved extra plot point as darkness really descends upon me here. Uh, Xavier and Beth did kill that priest. Their, that death was on them. Xavier had known that guy since he was a child and he was really upset about it. And their marriage got that priest killed. That priest was killed by angels, by a rogue, rogue CIA special ops angels murdered a priest <laughs> in a church. Because these two got married, and dear god, they don't spend enough time thinking about the manslaughter their marriage has created. <laughs> oh, I'm going insane.